This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Friday Fellows Conference. You can see our speaker this morning is Dr. Ariel Schwartz, second year fellow in our uh, in the clinical track, native of upstate New York. Uh, Ariel did her medical school at Georgetown University and her residency here at Emory. And as you can see, she is going to talk about left ventricular non-compaction. Take it away, Dr. Schwartz. All righty. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be starting with a case, and then we'll, then we'll get into a discussion regarding LV non-compaction. I also didn't want to proceed without just acknowledging the re really painful week we've had in the world, and I just want to send love and support to those in our community who are hurting right now. So um, this is a case of a 29-year-old female. She has a history of hypertension. She presents to an outside clinic with dyspnea and lower extremity swelling. She states that when she was a child, she actually had some abnormal breathing and she had an echo. She was told by her physician at the time that she had an overgrowth of her cardiac muscle. At that time, they actually attributed this to coffee that she would drink as an infant and a child. So the doctor told her to stay off of caffeine and hopefully things would improve. Her symptoms did seem to stabilize and she actually had two pregnancies without any major issues. It wasn't until her third pregnancy about two years ago that she developed heart failure and has since had NYHA3 symptoms. She's also experienced some palpitations and she was started on a beta, beta blocker with some improvement in these symptoms. Her blood pressure was 114 over 51 in the office. Her heart rate was 95 and she was saturating 100% on room air. Her exam was unremarkable other than a systolic murmur that was noted throughout her precordium. Otherwise, she seemed to be euvolemic on exam. She did not have any significant JVD and she did not have any peripheral edema. Here's her EKG, which clearly looks abnormal. Um, so she is in nor normal sinus rhythm at a rate of 72 beats per minute. As you can see, she has these deep asymmetric T wave inversions in many of the leads, including the inferior leads, the lateral leads, um, and some of the anterior lateral leads. I wanted to share with you her very impressive echo, and hopefully these videos work. Um, but regardless of the video's work, you can see she has a severely increased wall thickness with the LV posterior wall measuring 3.5 centimeters and an LV end diastolic diameter of 2.7 centimeters. So extremely thick wall and very small uh, cavity. She also had significantly diminished tissue Doppler velocities with the lateral E prime of three and an EDE of 22. Um, and here's the contrast echo. So her ejection fraction was read as 65 to 70%. She was then referred for cardiac MR, which shows these very prominent trabeculae and deep recesses, which we can appreciate here. This was not clearly seen on the echo. The non-compact to compact ratio was 4.8, which we'll talk about later. And the area there are areas of akinesis, which I'm not sure you can appreciate, but her apex and some of her inferior wall are really not moving well. The EF was also noted to be 28%. Note that this is very different than the EF noted from the echo. This is because by convention, this trabeculated myocardium is included in both the LV volumes, making the EF uh, lower. This image is looking for late gadolinium enhancement or LGE. And I'm not sure if you can appreciate this, but the black area here is the myocardium and we do not see any bright areas. So there was no delayed gadolinium enhancement to suggest myocardial fibrosis or scar. So overall, this patient was given the diagnosis of LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy. How do we manage this patient? So she was started on Xarelto 20 milligrams daily. She was referred for an ICD for primary prevention, and she was continued on her beta blocker. 
Unfortunately, given her borderline blood pressures, she was not, um, her, her GDMT was not up titrated at this time. So my objectives, I want to describe the history of LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy in the literature. I'm going to review the genetics and the proposed pathophysiology. We'll talk about associated clinical features and then focus on controversies regarding the diagnosis and review other patient populations who may have a similar phenotype. We'll then discuss reasonable management strategies for these patients. So LV non-compaction is characterized by a morphologic abnormality of the myocardium. So macroscopically, we can see these two layers of myocardium here. The more epicardial layer looks like normal myocardium, and the inner layer is this spongy, trabeculated myocardium here, which is clearly abnormal. We call the outer layer compacted and the inner spongy layer, layer non-compacted. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. So I just wanted to take a step back and review some of the history of LV non-compaction in the literature. Um, so non-compaction was first described in the literature in 1969 in a baby with congenital heart disease. This is the actual image from that baby. It was described in a case report as a bizarre spongy myocardium, which I think we can appreciate from the pictures here. In 1984, one of the first reports of ECHO was used to identify this two-layered myocardium with the innermost layer being this very deep trabeculated myocardium. And this was in a 33-year-old female with heart failure without evidence of congenital cardiac disease. So prior to the 90s, non-compaction was thought to be only, in, only present in association with other congenital abnormalities. However, in the 90s, this was increasingly recognized as not only associated with congenital defects, um, but also can be found in isolation with a cardiomyopathy. So this was termed isolated LV non-compaction in the 90s. And then in 1997, we start seeing uh, more reports of this using cardiac MR. So I wanted to talk about the pathophysiology. Theories about the development of, of this morphology really come from the observation that the spongy appearance of the LV non-compaction resembles that of the heart during fetal development. Between five to eight weeks of embryonic life, the myocardium is this net network of fibers with deep recesses, as we can see from this histology slide here. During normal development, there seems to be resolution of this phenotype over time, and it's been proposed that over time there is compaction of these fibers, which typically leads to this normal myocardium. An arrest of this normal process has been proposed, but not actually proven. Other theories include ischemia and pressure overload, which contribute to the prevention of these trabeculations regressing. Um, more recent theories say perhaps there is no arrest at all, but just an unequal growth of the trabecular layer and the compact layer, leading to a disproportionate ratio of increased trabeculation. So is this a genetic disease or something that occurs spontaneously? Um, the short answer is we don't know the full story but there does seem to be some cases of genetic inheritance. In the literature, percentages ranging from 12 to 50% of those with LV non-compaction have a family history of LV non-compaction. And autosomal dominant inheritance is more common than X-linked or autosomal recessive. Interestingly, there is considerable overlap in the genetic loci implicated in other cardiomyopathies, such as hypertrophic, cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathies. And you may recognize some of these genes as relating to other cardiomyopathies. So we see mutations in MYH7 in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the titan and laminate mutations can be seen in um, familial dilated cardiomyopathies. Interestingly, excessive trabeculation has also been observed in some neuromuscular disorders, including Duchenne and Becker dystrophy, However, a causal relationship with underlying genetic defects, defects has yet to be established for these patients. 
So what are the signs and symptoms of LV non-compaction? They seem to be highly variable, but if present, frequently relate to one of three clinical scenarios. So heart failure, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, and thromboembolic events. This is a slide from the Mayo Clinic videos on cardiomyopathy, which demonstrates the frequency of several signs and symptoms most commonly seen, with dyspnea being um, the most frequent. So starting off with heart failure, the underlying pathophysiology of heart failure remains unclear, but we know both systolic and or diastolic dysfunction can occur. There does seem to be evidence of hypoperfusion of the subendocardium on imaging, which may explain some of the ventricular dysfunction. And this can be seen on a CMR here, um, showing some uh, perfusion defects in the anterior septum and anterior wall. Additionally, hypertrabeculation likely makes it difficult for the myocardium to relax efficiently, leading to diastolic dysfunction and restrictive filling patterns in some. The true prevalence of heart failure in patients with LV non-compaction is unclear, as most of our data comes from case series of patients who were referred to tertiary care centers, most of, most of whom had symptoms. So in one study of 62 patients in whom this diagnosis was made, most patients, about two thirds of them had signs or symptoms of heart failure. And the majority of these patients were reporting NYHA three to four symptoms. What about arrhythmias? So the proarrhythmic substrate in these patients likely leads to both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. Additionally, the intertrabecular crypts are fibrosed, and this creates pathways for reentrant circuits. The frequency of ventricular arrhythmias has been cited in the literature as ranging from 18 to 47%, and sudden cardiac death has been described in 18% in one study of patients, whereas atrial arrhythmias occur in about a quarter of these patients. Um, again, a lot of our data are limited by relatively small numbers of patients in case series who were referred to care centers. Um, however, this is one case series of patients, um, 34 of them with LV non-compaction, were followed for about four years. Over those four years, 41% had ventricular tachycardia, 26% had AFib, 35% of them died, and four patients underwent transplant. So this is a very sick patient population, at least in our published case series. Occurrence of thromboembolic events, including stroke, TIA, mesenteric infarction have been reported in the literature. Um, the prevalence seems to range from 20s to 30% um, in published case, case series. The thought is that the prominent myocardial trabeculae and deep recesses cause stagnant blood flow, which can result in the formation of clots in the LV, which is seen very impressively in this photo. To the right, this is a case report of a 32-year-old male who had, who had um, previously come to the ED about a year prior to presentation with chest pain. He was noted to have a very trabeculated myocardium but unfortunately was not started on any ant anticoagulation at the time. He comes back one, one year later and presents with a catastrophic embolic stroke. His bubble study was negative and his carotids were normal. So the etiology of a stroke was thought to be from his LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy. This is just one example in the literature of how these patients with this type of cardiomyopathy are at risk of experiencing these devastating sequelae of thromboembolism. But how do we predict the patients with this phenotype that need anticoagulation from those who do not? Um, short answer is we really don't have a lot of data on this. However, this group in Vienna looked at about one, I think it was 169 patients, and they compared the clinical characteristics of those who had a stroke and or systemic thromboemboli to those who do not. 26 of the 169 patients, so 15% 15, 15 of these patients, had some sort of cardioembolic phenomenon. 
Interestingly, the patients with stroke or emboli had a higher CHADS2 and CHADS2 VAS scores compared to those who have this diagnosis but did not have um, any evidence of cardioembolic um, phenomena. So these scores could potentially be useful in risk stratifying these patients and guiding our anticoagulation strategy in them. But again, we need more data to validate this. I next want to talk about diagnosis. So diagnosis of LV non-compaction is based on morphologic imaging criteria alone. Echo remains the most common method of diagnosis. However, cardiac MR has better spatial resolution as we saw in our patient case um, in the beginning. Cardiac MR can also add prognostic information, which we'll talk about a little later. So there are a number of echo criteria to make the diagnosis. However, the Jenny criteria is the most commonly cited. This criteria was developed in 2001 to really distinguish non-compacted myocardium from that of the hypertrabeculated myocardi myocardium recognized in congenital cardiac patients. So to meet criteria, one must exclude coexisting cardiac anomalies such as various forms of congenital heart disease. Um, number two, so a two-layer structure must be seen, including a thin compacted outer layer, which we talked about, and a thick non-compacted inner layer. And the ratio of the distance must be greater than two in end systole. So as you can see from this image, here's the non-compact layer, this is the compact layer, and if that ratio of distances is greater than two, then that is diagnostic um, in end systole. Um, the trabeculae also must be localized to either the mid lateral and or mid in inferior and or apical regions. And, and then co color Doppler should be used to look at um, the intertrabecular recesses and make sure there is blood going into those recesses to confirm um, that that actually, you know, are those deep crypts and not just thick myocardium. Compared to echo, cardiac MR has greater contrast resolution and blood muscle differentiation. So this allows for better visualization of those trabeculae, which we saw on our patient case. Like echo, there have been several different criteria which have been suggested with the criteria by Peterson most frequently cited. Um, for this, to, to meet diagnostic criteria with the Peterson criteria, the ratio of the non-compacted to compacted layers must be greater than 2.3. And note, this is an end diastole instead of in systole um, with the echo criteria. This group aimed to validate these criteria and they compared cardiac MR from those with a diagnosis of LV non-compaction to healthy volunteers, athletes, patients with dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypertension, and aortic stenosis. And they found that the non-compacted to compacted ratio was actually much higher in LV non-compaction, supporting the usefulness of this diagnostic criteria. But something important to note is that only seven patients with LV non-compaction were used in the a study. Um, an alternative method of diagnosis has been looking at trabeculated LV mass. So if trabeculated LV mass is greater than 20% of the global LV mass, um, this is diagnostic and has been found to be highly sensitive and specific for LV non-compaction in retrospective studies. However, um, from speaking to Dr. Vadne, um, in his practice, Typically, he uses the Peterson criteria in conjunction with clinical characteristics to make this diagnosis. Um, he said that LV mass can be done, but is somewhat impractical and tedious. And so the Peterson criteria is most commonly used in um, MRI labs. So this slide is a little dense, but important in highlighting the potential utility of cardiac MR in prognostication of these patients. So we've all heard of late gadolinium enhancement. So LGE 
can be used to detect focal myocardial fibrosis. T1 mapping is conceptually similar, but a different technique to detect more diffuse abnormalities in myocardial structure, allowing for something called the or allowing for calculation of something called the extracellular volume or ECV fraction. So this can help detect diffuse fibrosis and edema that may actually be missed by late gadolinium enhancement. So this upper left image is the T1 mapping image. In this study from which this diagram comes from, 36 patients with LV non-compaction and 18 healthy volunteers were enrolled and all had cardiac MR. Compared to control subjects, patients with LV non-compaction had more LGE, and they also had this higher ECV percentage, which again is a marker of diffuse uh, edema and fibrosis. Interestingly, both LGE positive and LGE negative non-compaction patients had significantly increased ECV compared, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. The mean ECV in patients who had ventricular arrhythmias was significantly higher when compared to those without ventricular arrhythmias detected, regardless of LGE de detection, supporting the notion that ECV or extracellular volume fraction calculated from this T1 mapping may be helpful in predicting ventricular arrhythmias, even in the absence of gadolinium enhancement. Despite over 30 years of LV non-compaction being described in the literature, the prognosis of these patients remains uncertain, largely because the majority of our data comes from case series with limited numbers of patients, which we've talked about. So this study aimed to evaluate the predictors of all-cause mortality on the basis of clinical and imaging characteristics in these patients, and to compare the overall survival of these patients with um, that of the general population. So this was a retrospective cohort of 339 adults, which is a pretty sizable um, uh, case series, meeting echo and or cardiac MR criteria um, seen at the Mayo Clinic between 2000 and 2016. All of these patients met either Jenny criteria, so that echo criteria we talked about before, and or the Peterson criteria or the cardiac MR criteria we talked about before. From this study, there were three important findings. So number one, LV non-compaction patients had increased mortality compared with age and sex match uh, general population. Number two, ejection fraction less than 50% was associated with worse mortality outcomes in these patients, whereas those with an EF greater than 50% had similar mortality to the general population, despite having this diagnosis. Um, additionally, they found that the location of the trabeculations mattered in prognosis. So they compared when the trabeculations were in the mid and basal areas, as can be seen in this echo and cardiac MR. And they looked at that compared to trabeculations really localized to the apex, which can be seen in the echo and CMR here. What they found was that when the trabeculations were diffuse, this was associated with worse mortality outcomes, whereas those with isolated apical involvement was the mortality was found to be similar to the general population. So this schematic just basically summarizes everything that we just talked about. So again, mid-basal involvement and EF less than 50% predicted lower survival, whereas isolated apical trabeculations and an EF greater than 50% was associated with a survival similar to the general population. So we've covered a lot so far and I hope I haven't lost you, but I just wanted to summarize some of the things that we've talked about. So. LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy can be associated with heart failure, arrhythmia, and or thromboembolism. There are some ge genetic underpinnings, but it is not fully explained by genetics. 
And the pathophysiology seems to be unclear, but may be related to some sort of premature arrest in utero. Diagnosis is made by either echo and or CMR, and CMR may be helpful in prognostication of these patients. Prognosis seems variable and seems dependent on ejection fraction, as well as the extent of the trabeculations. For the remainder of the talk, I want to discuss some of the challenges and controversy with this diagnosis. I will also be using the terms hypertrabeculation and LV non-compaction interchangeably. Um, and so hypertrabeculation is an incidental finding in several different patient populations. LV non-compaction is being overdiagnosed in patients without any other signs or symptoms of cardiomyopathy, which we'll talk about. There are no clear guidelines regarding management, but towards the end of the talk, I'll actually be proposing my recommendation for management of these patients uh, based on what I've read. So um, hypertrabeculation is common in children. So this observation was made from a population-based study the screen to prevent study. So this was a large study of over 5,000 middle and high school students in Houston. The whole point of the study was identi to identify high risk factors associated with sudden cardiac death in the young. However, one of the surprises of the study and relevant to this talk was the high incidence of hypertrabeculation in these children. So much so that 18.6% of these children met diagnostic criteria for LV non-compaction based on the Peterson criteria or that cardiac MR criteria that we talked about before. This persisted for each racial group, as you can see in the table here, and males had significantly more trabeculations compared to females. Note that 18, note that about 20% of this subset with trabeculations had symptoms with dyspnea being the most common followed by chest discomfort. But it's important to note that over 80% of these kids with these trabeculations had no cardiac issues and no symptoms and an excellent exercise capacity as well. Trabeculations have also been commonly observed in highly trained athletes undergoing screening with echo, which poses a big dilemma regarding the management of the asymptomatic athlete with this incidental finding. The purpose of this study was to evaluate LV trabeculations in highly trained athletes and compare that to the normal population. So over 1,100 competitive athletes um, were enrolled in the study, um, as well as 415 healthy controls. Athletes displayed higher prevalence of increased LV trabeculation compared with controls. And 10% of athletes in this cohort actually met criteria by ECHO for LV non-compaction compared to zero of the healthy controls. Um, interestingly, increased trabeculation was also found in Black athletes, suggesting genetic factors may also play a role. The authors proposed that potentially the high cardiac preload and afterload demands in competitive ath athletics are to blame for this type of phenotype, that potentially there is some type of remodeling that occurs with high cardiac preload and afterload demands. Increased trabeculations are also observed in pregnant patients. So this study looked at 102 pregnant women who were evaluated longitudinally with a series of echoes. During pregnancy, one quarter of these patients developed increased trabeculations, which was most prominent during the third trimester. And then most of these patients, 75%, demonstrated complete resolution of these trabeculations postpartum. And again, the authors propose that potentially increased LV loading conditions during pregnancy may lead to some of these changes. Um, 
Also, interestingly, African-American women were three times more likely to develop these features during pregnancy than Caucasian women, again, suggestive of an underlying genetic susceptibility and vulnerability for um, African-Americans. So what about in the general population? So we talked about kids, we talked about athletes, we talked about pregnant women. What about in just the general population? So this study looked at a cohort of the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis cohort or MISA. So this was a population-based longitudinal study, which was initiated in 2000. And the overall aim of this study was to identify high-risk factors for atherosclerosis. Cable et al. in 2012 selected 323 of these patients who did not have any heart disease or hypertension, and they looked at the non-compacted to compacted ratios to get a sense of what a normal ratio in the general, general population is. This diagram here displays the myocardial regions actually meeting diagnostic criteria on cardiac MR. So the outer circle here refers to the mid-cavitary, and the inner circle here reverts to the apical regions. As you can see, 20.8% 20 of this group met criteria in the apical anterior region, and 16.3% met criteria in the apical lateral uh, region. So taking all of this together, at least 43% or of the general population were meeting the Peterson criteria for LV non-compaction in at least one region. Um, so the, these results suggest that trabeculated myocardium is a common incidental finding in the general population, and maybe we should reevaluate our current um, criteria for this diagnosis. An alternative question and an important one based on some of these population-based studies is how do we know this is an incidental finding? Well, what if we are detecting patients who are at risk of developing cardiomyopathy later in life? Well, this group actually followed the cohort studied in this study um, with excessive trabeculations for 10 years, and they followed these patients with serial cardiac MRI. Over 10 years, there was no development of heart failure symptoms, and there were no significant changes in ejection fraction or LV volumes. So in other words, the presence of trabeculation in, its, in and of itself did not seem to predict future cardiovascular deterioration. Many studies have shown that ejection fraction is the predominant mediator for adverse outcomes in this patient population and not the presence of trabeculation alone. What about the prognosis of patients with LV trabeculations with a reduced EF, like our patient in the case I presented? How does this compare to those with other non-ischemic cardiomyopathies? This data is based on a meta-analysis, and it shows that the pooled event rate of cardiovascular death and malignant ventricular arrhythmias was comparable between dilated cardiomyopathy and cardiomyopathy with excessive trabeculation. There does seem to be a higher incidence of heart failure hospitalization associated with LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy compared to non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, which warrants uh, more research. So should we look at excessive trabeculations as a phenotype rather than a distinct diagnosis? Given the observation that increased trabeculations can be seen incidentally in people without cardiac disease and their presence alone does not seem to predict future cardiovascular risk, perhaps we should not define this, this structural phenotype as a diagnosis, but rather just a characteristic, which can be seen in normal people and or as a response to increased preload, such as in athletes or pregnant people. This is a graphic from a JAK state-of-the-art review that was published actually several months ago. And this group advocates for relabeling LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy as excessive trabeculation instead. As non-compacted myocardium implies a cardiomyopathy, whereas trabeculation seems to be a more neutral expression. Additionally, they advocate 
for um, the idea that clinical man management should not be determined by this structural characteristic alone, but rather signs and symptoms of cardiomyopathy if it does develop. So based on reading all of these studies and learning a lot more about LV non-compaction um, than I ever knew, I tried to put together a reasonable management strategy for when we see these patients in clinic or happen to read an echo um, with, you know, this structural phenotype. So I'll go through this. So first, if we see excessive trabeculation in one of our patients, I think one of the first questions is, does this patient have a reduced EF? If yes, I think it's fair to order a cardiac MR. If the cardiac MR has high-risk features, which some of which we touched upon, including late gadolinium enhancement, high ECV fraction, um, then I think it's fair to refer for an early ICD as these patients have a higher risk of ventricular arrhythmias. I think all patients with excessive trabeculation and a reduced EF should probably be put on anticoagulation because of those deep crypts we, we talked about, which causes the stagnant blood flow and increases chances of um, thromboembolism. And then I, right now, we are treating patients with LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy with regular GDMT if the EF is low. Um, again, there's not clear data for any of these um, pathways, but I think based off of the case series and the information, we know that this is a reasonable um, strategy. So if there is not a reduced EF, we'll then look at where the trabeculations are. If they're diffuse and in the mid-basal segments, then I think it's fair to consider anticoagulation. But again, we don't know if this is true and we don't have data to validate that. Um, if the trabeculations are localized to the apex, I think we ask, does this patient have symptoms? If yes, then consider a cardiac MR and or consider ambulatory monitoring to look for arrhythmias. However, if there are no symptoms, then simply do nothing, as this is likely just an incidental finding. And what about athletes? So this position statement, this is a position statement from the sports cardiology section of the European Association of Preventive Cardiology. And essentially they recommend that if this is an incidental discovery and there are no other high risk features, then there's no restri restriction for competitive sports. However, of course, if there are some concerning features, including family history, um, syncope, et cetera, then more investigation is warranted. So future directions. Um, number one, how do we create more specific diagnostic criteria to differentiate those patients with a true cardiomyopathy from those who just have this as an incidental finding? How do we risk stratify these patients? Who benefits from prophylactic anticoagulation? Who benefits from primary prevention ICD? All of these questions are very important and we just don't have the answers right now. Um, additionally, who should have routine ambulatory monitoring? And larger registries are in the works. So hopefully um, we may have answers to some of these questions in the future. So just to summarize, the cardiomyopathy associated with LV hypertrabeculation or LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy can be associated with heart failure, arrhythmia, and or thromboembolism. Trabeculated myocardium can also be seen incidentally on cardiac imaging and may not have any clinical implications. Certain characteristics, including reduced EF, mid and basal involvement of trabeculation, LGE, and elevated ECV on cardiac MRI are helpful in prognostication. And then we have a lot to learn about the optimal management strategy of these patients, including timing and referral for ICD and anticoagulation. So I just want to take a minute to thank all of the people that helped me. Um, thank you, Mariana. Um, she, you, she has been such a supportive mentor to me throughout uh, prepping for this presentation. Um, she went above and beyond in reviewing the imaging. 
of this case with me and sending me resources, which were extremely helpful. Um, thank you to Dr. Coley for your feedback and help as well, and Dr. Badne for um, reviewing the images with me and sharing your Im imaging expertise with me. And here are my references. All right, well, thanks, Ariel. Fantastic review. A um, couple of things. One is uh, the your the statistics you quoted on sudden uh, on cardiac arrest in these patients do sort of remind me to uh, about some of the early data from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cohorts. Similarly, um, where early cohorts you know quoted a ten to fifteen percent annual risk of cardiac arrest, and these were of course um, biased towards sicker patients at referral centers, et cetera, uh, because we didn't have a, a great understanding of what the true denominator was for the disease. But you know, now, several decades later, that number has fallen to less than 1% annual risk for, for cardiac arrest. So my, my suspicion, it's a, a similar sort of situation here. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. I, I guess my other question would be, regarding sort of genetic testing slash family screening. I know there's obviously, I don't think there's sort of a hard and fast recommendations, but you sort of alluded to it. Would you recommend sort of widespread genetic testing in this population? And would that guide your recommendations regarding family screening um, or more selective in patients that have reduced LV function and or symptoms, et cetera? What would be your, your thought? Yeah, that's an excellent question and actually something I did not address in that um, management uh, schematic. Um, I think at this point, there's not enough data to make that recommendation, but I do think that it's definitely reasonable um, and probably very helpful for the future of um, research in this disease. But um, again, yeah, I don't think we have the data to confidently say that that would be helpful. So um, I can comment on that as well. Um, first of all, terrific, terrific talk. I think you really nailed it um, with this. But the genetic literature, particularly over the last 10 or 12 years, has really revealed that LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy is not um, a standalone entity, or at least if it is, it's in exceedingly rare cases. Um, probably the only case I know of, there's a gene mutation called MIB1, which is in the notch signaling pathway. And there's been a number of big development papers in the last five or six years that show that that pathway controls the trabeculation of the heart em embryologically, but it literally has been described in two families in the literature, and that is it. But when you look at genetic studies of patients with LV non-compaction, i.e. where the proband, the first patient identified, has LV non-compaction and a reduced EF, most of the family members that are affected and have the gene mutation that is being studied in the paper do not have LV non-compaction as the phenotype. They have DCM. And there's a one or two studies with HCM, but it's, it's basically a variant phenotype of DCM. So actually... Um, Screening is covered in Ray Hirschberger's genetic cardiomyopathy um, guideline paper from, I think, 2018, um, where they do recommend serial screening for LV non-compaction, but it would be the same screening um, that you would do for somebody that seems to have familial DCM. So you would do, I would, I would act like it's, you know, a DCM family and go with uh, the Rex accordingly, which is, you know, periodic screening every couple of years for adults. Um, if you don't find a gene mutation, if you do find a gene mutation that's pathologic for a DCM or um, a variant, you can then do cascade genetic testing. Um, I would not screen these um, healthy people that have hypertrabeculation because as you very, very nicely pointed out, it doesn't progress. And you see it in athletes. I think an interesting question that's also not answered is why does hypertrabeculation come up in these people? Is it, um, you know, the increased preload, right? You're talking about pregnancy, um, athletes. These are conditions where the preload is, is increased because the LV is dilated. Uh, but that's never been worked out at the, at the molecular level. 
a great job. Thank you, Dr. Burke. That was really helpful. Uh, Stan Sherman, Ariel, just great talk. Uh, but could you uh, say a little bit more about ejection fractions? Because it seemed like the example you gave in the very beginning, there was a good bit of difference between getting an EF off the echo and getting it off the MRI. And maybe the MRI is necessary to get a good ejection fraction or uh are there are there things that we should be doing there and uh uh has strain been looked at in in, in these patients at all yeah absolutely and let me just bring back the echo so initially you know this ejection fraction looking at the echo looks very robust um which is why i was read as 65 to 70 percent by visual estimate um but I think something that is very evident from the cardiac MR that is not evident from the echo is these very deep recesses where blood is um, pooling. And so the diagnosis of LV non-compaction was not made until the cardiac MR revealed these, these highly trabeculated areas of the myocardium. And so in talking to Dr. Vadne, because I had the same question, um, he was saying that by convention, this area, so this non-compacted um, volume is included in both the end diastolic and the end systolic volume. So you can imagine if that's included in the, in the blood pool, then the ejection fraction is going to be a lot lower than it was in this echo where the cavity was thought to be very small. Um, additionally, um, he was pointing out that, and I know this video is not the highest quality and choppy, but the myocardium really is not moving well, this compacted area here, which further supports that the ejection fraction is likely a lot lower and kind of the myocardial contractility is a lot lower, um, than was thought from the echo here. One thing on echo, um, and I will... I will um, credit Sandra Pernetz, our fine longtime sonographer, for teaching me about this. That's interesting with LV non-compaction is um, looking at rotational dynamics of the LV um, under normal circumstances. You know, the apex sort of rotates clockwise compared to the base, and you can sort of measure the amount of rotation and sort of the LV sort of almost, you know, rings you know, almost like a, like you're wringing a wet rag uh, to to eject the blood, and that rotational um, dynamic gets lost in LV non compaction to a significant degree in a lot of patients because uh, you know the endocardium sort of plays such a big role in that rotation, and when you have this sort of abnormally formed disjointed endocardium, you lose that ability for the ventricle to rotate. So that's one of the things that we've looked at in very small groups in our lab have on echo and maybe could be a predictor of like sort of severity of disease and severity of involvement and, and future issues, you know, down the road in a patient who LV seemingly normal, but may have trouble down the road because their rotation is just gone because of their non-compacted endocardium, but just a sort of interesting um, uh, component to this, to this disease. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to uh, thank Ariel again and again, again um, echo the sentiments of the group, a, a really fantastic and comprehensive talk. And and uh, and thanks to you for in what has obviously been a difficult week. So um, for you and a lot of others. So uh, thanks again. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. And I look forward to seeing everybody next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.